started there. All right, so uh, welcome. Um, this open meeting of the Hopkinton Appropriation Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of the emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of all open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of the public all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. For this meeting, the Appropriation Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom webinar as posted on the town's web meeting calendar and the board's agenda identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting business ground rules. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, Permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in dialogue with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Not every agenda item will feature public comment. For the public forum portion of the agenda, the chair will work with the meeting host to call on each pre-registered speaker to make their comment. Each speaker must begin by identifying their name and address. Each speaker will have up to three minutes for their comments. Finally, each vote taken at this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. All right, thank you. So I'll call the meeting to order. Um, Shahadul, can you take uh, minutes today? That would be appreciated. So on the agenda today, uh, we have public comment. And then we're gonna, the Appropriation Committee will discuss the fiscal year 22 budget proposals for health and human services finance, human resources, IT, land use, and town clerk and elections departments. Then we'll review questions from previous budget sessions and review changes to estimated revenue or expenses. And finally, revenue planning for appropriation committee report. So first on the agenda, we have public comment and we do have uh, public comment today. And today we have uh, Anne, um, if you can state your name and address and, and you're free to speak. Okay, they're not barking now. This is Ann Karnofsky. I live at 132 East Main Street. Okay, and what would you like to talk about or comment? Well, um, I was informed that I had to speak before the capital improvements, the appropriations, and the community preservation, and I guess the appropriations is the only one I haven't yet. Um, I have formed a citizens group called Save the Forest. Um, what we are aiming to do is preserve the about 75 acres of mature forest um, that is adjoining the already preserved deer run um, sanctuary, it, that's only 12 ac acres, but the two together uh, make one. And this has, according to Mike Rowan, the trails in this forest are from colonial times. There's also Indian ceremonial stones in there. So um, also there is no other place for East Hopkinton to recreate uh, these trails are long and winding. Uh, they're not just uh, a little half mile. Um, 
now that we have North and South Legacy Farms, uh, we don't have any habitat left. And um, it's also the people that live at North and South Legacy Farms do enjoy the trails as well. Unfortunately, Liberty Mutual offered the town this land to buy this land and the town at the moment at that time was not interested. I have a feeling the town would be interested now because Seaboard Solar has plans to go in there by any means um, and clear cut it all and put in ground mounted solar. Um, they've even tried to go around the town concon by getting a DCR permit to harvest the wood, but that didn't go very far. Um, we have an abutter that can afford to support a major environmental attorney. The case won't come up in Superior Court for three years. At the same time, I sense an interest in the town that rather than being adversarial to enforce the building, the uh, excuse me, the special permit for this solar project, I think the town could take the forest by eminent domain and should. And in fact, I wrote a letter today uh, to the select board and to Elaine Lazarus with some suggestions. Now, we've already been voted favorably by community preservation. They think they would have enough money to spend on this land. I believe it's worth 350000 and um, we've been uh, voted favorably by the board of select uh, by the select board and uh, capital improvement. So I I just if we uh, Norman Kumalo has gone to try to negotiate a price with uh, Seaboard Solar. I think eventually they're going to have to cave. If they don't cave. Uh, by eminent for the eminent domain or for the uh, superior court case, I think they're going to. I think that they are going to. I I don't say if they don't. I think they're going to have to, and they're going to have to find brownfield spaces for these uh, commercial solar farms. Uh, Hopkinton shouldn't have this uh, beautiful forest ru ruined. So. May I have any questions or whenever you get to the questions? All right. Sure. Is is there, I'm, I'm not too familiar with this, except what we had at the last town meeting. Um, is there a warrant upcoming on, on is there in the war, is there a warrant article for this? I wrote meeting? one. I wrote one, but unfortunately it was the same as pretty much the same as the one last year. And I wish I could write one now, but I guess it's too late. Um, because I would love to have a warrant article about the town taking those 75 acres by eminent domain and also prescriptive easement, because um, the, uh, the, that forest belonged to the town until it was bought by Liberty Mutual in 1976. And Liberty Mutual let the town residents use the trails anyway. Uh, so prescriptive easement, I, I believe, implies if the use has been going on probably since the town was established, uh, that the town has the right to take it by that, by prescriptive easement or eminent domain. Um, so I think, I think between the town council and the abutters attorney, I think they could work out a way to convince Seaboard to... Uh, to sell for a reasonable price. Uh, it's at, uh, the official address is 71 Franklin Road Rear, but right now the best entrance is on Thorn Ridge Road. But I suggest that you could have entrances on Franklin Road, on Cross Street, and Thorn Ridge Road. It, and it's used uh, right now until Seaboard put up no trespassing signs and made Hall take their trail uh, uh, map down from the internet. Um, it, it's been used for nature study, hiking, um, bike, bicycling, and horseback riding. We have many uh, horse, 
We have at least two horse barns in the area. Um, it's just so widely used. Do have people that travel on their bicycles from the other side of town just to get there? Okay. Did I explain the uh, what you asked? Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, yes, I'm clear. Does anyone else have questions? Hi. Hi, Bill. I do have a question, if it's okay. Um, th through the chair, I, I'm curious, you mentioned a, a number of $350,000. Where did that come from? Is that what was offered to the town at one point? Um, I'll tell you where it came from. I read the real estate pages in the Metro West Daily News every Friday. And I've also spoken to the man from Liberty that sold uh, the, the forest. So I know that Seaboard has, they paid in total 400, let's see, 400, 435 million dollars, I guess, for the forest and the front parcel. They sold the front parcel which has a building on Franklin Road. It used to be the Liberty Mutual building. They sold that to a, um, a company that just bought it for an investment. They're going to rent it out for office space. And they, uh, Seaboard recovered $4 million, uh, most of their land investment, by that sale. Um, so there's only 350000 left uh, for them to recover. I'm, I'm thinking it's a fair price. Okay, thank you. Oh wait, I'm on mute. Shahadul, do you, you're on mute. Do you have any questions? Um, who? Okay, I don't think we have any additional questions. So, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Next on the agenda is uh, we're going to talk about the budget proposals. And uh, first, uh, we're going to move it around a little bit. I know, Maria, you have to go. So, you can go first from Human Resources. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, just a little bit about HR. HR's role is to care for town employees, having fun wherever possible, uh, strengthen Team Hopkinton, take care of employees and their families' good health, and develop its leaders. So um, might be interesting for you to know, we care for 322 town employees, um, 58 senior volunteer workers, and 392 retirees and all of their benefits. Um, as presented to the select board, um, the HR budget, um, uh, the original budget without the 1% impact uh, for personnel services is $229,704. Expenses are at 124,455. And the remainder of the budget is the compensation contingency fund to address com contractual obligations and anything, un anything unforeseen. With the exception of salary, there was only one um, increase request, $220 for credentialing for the benefits position. And the HR budget at the time presented to the select board is 0.91% year to year percentage change and below the two and a half threshold. So thank you. All right, thank you, Maria. So I do, I am looking at it. So it's, are there any, is there any changes in the number of personnel? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have 
questions? Um, Bill? Well, I, uh, I guess the only question I have is the request you're, you're asking for, the amount, is that typically year in and year out or is this an abnormal year where it's only a 1% increase? I, it's typical with the exception of the staff um, increases. The only additional ask was $220 for the benefits position. She maintains an HRCI certification, which is very valuable to the town. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you, Bill. Just, just for future years, a couple of percent would be a typical year. I think Maria on the personnel line. So generally a couple of percent, 2%, 3%, something like that. Okay. Shahadul, do you have any questions? I think he's having trouble with his audio there. I see you, I see you waving. We cannot hear you. Oh, is he talking to you, Chris? Is he trying to get in on his phone? Uh, it looks like he may be. Shadu, your phone might be muted if it ends in 9-6. I think that's, is that Ann or Chief Leaf? You know, that's not, that's not Shadu. This is Ann. Um, yep. I, I just wanted to say that um, community preservations would oh. uh, would probably have enough funding without taking more out of your tre treasury. They would at least have the 350000 They, I believe oh. they, they would have spent it this year if we could get Seaboard to sell. Okay, Ann, I, I, sorry, I didn't have a question for you. We're, we're on to the next agenda item so, on, in the meeting. So sorry about that. Just hey, folks, it's Wayne here. Just let me jump yeah. in. I have terrible connectivity. Um, so I'm probably going to be dropping in and out. If I have any questions, I'll find some way to. OK. Um, if you want to text me, you can do that, too. Um, but you may see me. See me I'm traveling, so. So Chahadul. Yeah, so I am. I did get a text from Shahadul. He says link is for webinar. He can't speak or chat. Well, he's his doppelganger's here. Let's see if this one can talk. Can you hear me now? Now yes. we can. Now we can hear you, Shahadul. Uh, uh, where's the link for the meeting? It's right in the email. It's also in the agenda. We actually remember we asked Chris to uh, to make it more clear, and he, so it's right in the agenda. It's right, not in the agenda. It's right in the uh, invitation. The okay. Oh, sorry about that. We can hear you now, fine. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes. Uh, then I'll use my phone. This one is good. Uh, sorry, I missed quite a bit. My general question for this was, um, what is the change from last year to this year? Uh, and what's the reason for that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the second part of the question. The, the overall percentage change is 0.91. OK. And uh, what is that attributed to? Um, salary increases, and the only additional request was $220 for the benefits position that maintains a, you know, a professional HR credentialing through HRCI. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Shadow. Wayne, did you have any questions? Or I know you said your connectivity is so poor. Are you going to sit and listen in, I guess? I think I am good. And I seem to be a little stable, so. We can hear you fine. So you're, are you good with okay. questions? 
All right. I'm good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Maria. I think we're all we're good. Thank you very much. All right. So next on the agenda is uh, Health and Human Services. Sean uh, McAuliffe, you have from the Health Department. Welcome. Can you uh, hear me? Thank you. Um, this, apologies, uh, Head. I just just walked in from uh, our uh, the last day of our Pfizer clinic, so I'm uh, trying to collect myself. <laughs> um, so. Um, just briefly, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so new, uh, so recently set, seated that I am still pulling up papers. But um, um, do you want me to? We can go uh, on to the next person if you want to need a little time to. Well, I mean, uh, at, at the end of the day, I um, you know my I think we're we're all fairly familiar with what <clears throat> the health department and I've been I've been talking all day, so my voice is shot. Um, so. Um, you know, this this year was a, a highly unusual year where, you know, um, my public health nurse and I have been <clears throat> involved in uh, COVID-19 related pandemic responses. Um, and while in the progress or process of addressing the responses, we felt it necessary to um, bring on an additional um, full-time person to the department. Um, we're pleased to announce that an offer through Maria and her team, um, an offer was submitted uh, or provided on Friday. The uh, candidate is accepted. So the largest budget impact um, that you'll see on my, um, uh, on my spreadsheet accounts for that new person coming onto the, uh, the team. Um, then the only other additional increase um, that we are uh, presenting is an extra, I believe it's $15,000 to cover um, anticipated increases in um, annual uh, vaccination, um, where we believe that moving beyond the calendar year and into the next uh, following year, um, we're going to be incurring um, additional um, vaccination expenses associated with COVID um, and maybe any of its variants. Um, that said, you know, we are, and uh, I'm committed to providing um, as much grant support or bringing in as much grant support as I can. But um, whereas grants are unknown and unreliable, um, we thought it prudent to put um, in for an additional fifteen thousand dollars to uh, cover potential costs, um, you know, moving forward. All right. Thank you, Sean. Um, any questions, Wayne? We'll start with you this time. Do you have any questions? Sure. Um, so on the current year. Wayne, did we did we just lose you? Yeah, you did. Okay, Wayne. Now, 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 your connection isn't very stable. Um, how, I guess what what what, how, what was the impact? Um, it, you know, if you include what if you include the um, the addition of the new employee, it's a thirty four percent increase, and then an eighteen percent um, or eighteen and a half percent increase. Or expenses. I don't know if Wayne was asking what would be the impact if it wasn't for the new employee. Um, would it still be? What would it have been? Thirty four percent or? It, it would have nothing? been. It, if if we hadn't brought on the new employee, it would have been roughly I think twelve thousand five hundred. There's. A portion of those charges, a portion of the additional request does cover um, some additional training and certification requirements okay. for the new employee. Okay, thanks. Can you, can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Okay. Now I can't. 
All right. We and I will. guess the only other question was, what was the impact of any grants for the just text? I'll text you. Okay, Wayne. Um, a question, and uh, I'll just uh, mute for now. All right. Thanks, Wayne. All right, Shahadul, you're next. Any questions? You muted your sounds off again, Shadu. Can't hear, can't hear you, Shahadul. So, Bill, do you have any questions? Sure, a couple. Um, I, just doing the quick math, um, Sean, then a $12,000 increase on a $200,000 budget would be about a 5% increase. Does that sound reasonable to you that that's what it would be without the additional employee? That, 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 that sounds reasonable. Okay. Uh, like I, I said, I, I, you know, that's I, fine. I was just yeah. trying to give uh, Wayne a little bit of uh, texture because it sounds like he can't see the budgets like we can. So my, my other question is, I can appreciate that you're, you're doing a great job getting as many grants as possible. And I know we don't know the answer to this question yet, but with the recent 1.9 trillion that's been signed, it looked like parts of it go on for several years dealing with vaccinations and COVID. I'm wondering if there might be even money there that we're not aware of, and if there is, and yet you still get the 15,000 allocated for this budget, what happens at the end of the year? Um, that, that, if, if that money is covered, if you will. Thank you. So we, we have consistently returned money back to the, um, the municipality. Okay. Um, I believe last year it was somewhere on the range of, um, I believe it was around 8,000. So we, we consistently return it back. And, and that's the, you know, th this is this, it's some of it's, I wouldn't call it a shell game, but it's, um, you know, we are aggressive, and, and to this point, um, I don't know that um, we've really expended any of our prior budget on COVID costs because we've been so aggressively seeking grant funding. But given, you know, at the time that this was provide, uh, produced, um, we didn't know if we were going to, you know, which president we were gonna have, how we were gonna have to brace ourselves for, um, you know, the future so we went and asked for um you know the extra and um you know and we have as i said we've okay. um we've been aggressively seeking any outside funding and outside um opportunities that we can um, great well thank you for that and and um obviously we haven't had a chance to meet yet but Seems like I see you every day, either on Hopkinton News or in the newspapers or on these calls. So uh, I know a lot of people work hard, but uh, thank you for all the yeah. work you're doing because it. We we don't better. sleep. We just we just move around the town. It, it doesn't day. seem like you do. So thank you. <laughs> That's the only questions I have. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, one question I'm just passing on from Wayne um, is that what is the impact of any grants that you've had for the current year? Uh, um. Or so, what grants have you had? So we've received, I'm trying to do the math quickly in my head. I think we were, we've received close to this and not including CARES Act. Um, I want to say we're close to 60,000. It's about 20, just shy of 20,000 from the Metro West Health Foundation. Um, about 20, 26,000 from um, the DPH MRC group. And then another, um, I think another 5,000 or so for um, the cost of refrigeration for um, in case we were doing mobile vaccination clinics. And then we, we have an opportunity and we, if, if we're allowed to open up mass vaccination sites, we'll be having a whole different discussion. Um, okay. but, um, it's, uh, but, you know, a lot of this is, like I said, it, it's, if you, if you have a chance to talk to the chief and see, 
the the amount of uncertainty and unknown and the how you know my life changes day to day it's uh you know we're we're collecting everything we can to put the municipality and the department in the best financial position we can so that we are prepared moving forward into the year and again you know what we don't use we uh, we turn back okay thank you um Shahadul, well, can we hear you now? Do you have any questions? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, sorry, I missed the part. I didn't fully follow, so I'll skip for now. All right. Thank you, Shahadul. All right, that's it for us. Thank you. Okay, all right, terrific, thank you. Thanks, Sharon. You're welcome. I'll be in touch. <laughs> All right, so next on the agenda is, not on the agenda, but next is uh, uh, finance. So Ben, is that you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, since finance is gonna be here anyways, let's get people who can go home and get back to their families uh, go first. So why don't you skip us to the end if you can. We can sure do that. Um, so IT, so we have uh, Josh Crisetti, welcome. Good evening, thank you. Josh Crosetti here, Director of IT for the town um, to present and discuss the IT budget. Um, high, high level overview, uh, we're seeing under the town managers recommended uh, two and a half percent budget, an increase in personnel services of $46,572. So this is due to hiring uh, for a seat that is currently vacant at a uh, salary that is expected to be slightly higher than the, the Can anybody hear me? Did we lose Josh? Josh, I think you're frozen. Yeah. The system Josh. is really not very stable today. Josh, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you folks. He's back, okay. Oh, okay. We, we lost you for a little bit. Sorry about that. I could hear um, you folks. <laughs> um, where did I cut out? I was just speaking about the uh, personnel budget. Yeah, you were talking about the personnel budget and yep. uh, the explaining the increase. Okay, excellent. And, and so after that, um, on the expense budget, uh, we're requesting an increase in operating costs of $92,316. Um, so we do have a number of line items where we're seeing a decrease in costs due to smart cost containment and some renegotiated terms with existing vendors. Um, really the primary cost drivers for this increase are attributed to uh, just a few things. We have a support contract for a new public safety computer-aided dispatch and records management system. We have additional platform licensing for continued use of our GIS system. Uh, we have expanded third-party transparency tools and uh, moving more departments towards an e-permitting solution. Okay. I just, uh, I have a quick question. So are these expenses, are they reoccurring costs or are they one time? Are we expecting like the same types of increase? Are they going to be continually year over year? Um, the, the cost drivers that are causing these increases uh, are, are recurring costs, but these are recurring costs that we're realizing going into fiscal 22. So the, the percentage increase is not expected to be the same year over year. Okay, and then the person personnel services, um, is there any additional uh, employees or is what's the 15.4%? What's the driver for the, the large increase there? Yep. So we had, um, we had one employee uh, depart uh, through organic attrition. And so as, as part of that, we uh, reimagined the role and the, the new job description uh, 
you know, resulted in a, in a slight increase in what we're expecting in terms of market rate pay to backfill that position. So that's a portion of it. And, uh, and then the other portion is in moving an existing part-time seat to full-time. Okay. Uh, Shahadul, do you have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, I did get the full uh, view this time. So I um, wanted to just check with you, what is your personal um, situation like um, in terms of full-time and part-time service employees? Sure, so uh, right this minute today and what we've been at for the past uh, 11 and a half months is two full-time employees, uh, one part-time employee. Okay. And, and how do you, I'm just trying to understand uh, your service model. How do you kind of divvy up the roles and responsibilities? Well, there's, there's two and there's two and a half of us that support uh, 200 employees, um, more than 700 devices and over a thousand software applications. Um, we, uh, we, 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 the two and a half of us do whatever we have to do to, to get it done. Thank you for your service. That's a huge productivity, no doubt. Um, so um, the second question, I, I think the first part understandable with the employee situation and uh, so having someone coming in, in the, especially in the technology sector. Uh, the second part, uh, can you elaborate on the expense increase? I didn't fully catch that, sorry. Sure, so um, really the, the drivers to the increase, um, I, I can speak a little bit more to each of them and then if you have any, any specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, the first is related to the support contract that's tied to our new uh, computer-aided dispatch and records management system. So we're going from uh, something that was a, a, a pretty legacy system to a contemporary uh, CAD dispatch. And so with that comes an increase of about $13,000 in additional um, annual support and maintenance costs. Um, we're seeing an increase in our GIS licensing costs of about $17,000. Um, this is to, to better take advantage of some of the enhanced features uh, and tools that we have available um, on, on the same platform. So we're not migrating vendors. We're just um, you know, turning on some additional features using some additional uh, licensing. Uh, we have a, a small increase budgeted for expanded third-party transparency tools. So these are some of the add-ons and features that we have on the public website and that we use behind the scenes in preparation um, for that data that's represented to the public. And then lastly, uh, an e-permitting solution um, that, would, that would work towards getting the entirety of the town, all, uh, all departments that, that utilize any kind of permitting onto a standardized online e-permit solution. Got it, thank you. And uh, in general, in terms of your services, are you adding any new service? That's one question and second is, for the website, uh, what is the current support scenario and what's your plan for future? Sure, um, in, in terms of services, uh, no, there's not any, any large single um, new service, right? So again, there's, there's some of that licensing that's coming on the GIS side. Um, so that could help with things like, like dashboards, um, some employee engagement tools, some resident engagement tools, uh, the e-permitting software that I, that I already mentioned. Um, but besides that, no, there, there's no other large cost driver related to new service in that aspect. Uh, with regards to the website, we um, have a, a service contract with our hosting provider for those services. And the, uh, the IT staff makes the majority of those, of those changes actually on the website itself with input provided by uh, departments. Thank you. And is there any plan to upgrade or um, uh, add or modify any design on the website. We hear, um, you know, there are opportunities to improve. I just wanted to get your perspective and if any plan or thoughts on that. Uh, th this budget does not include a line item for a um, massive overhaul or redesign of the website. 
Got it. Thank you. Uh, I think I covered what I wanted. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate your help. Sure thing. All right. Thank you, Shahdul. Uh, uh, Bill, do you have anything? Yes. Uh, just to follow up on that question. Do you have a ballpark in your mind? You used the word massive when you thought about redesigning the website. What would that look like if it was in your budget? Uh, that's a that's a tough question to answer. Um, that's a real tough question to answer. Um, I mean, if that was a, a redesign where we stayed with our existing content management solution, our existing hosting provider, and and did something along the lines of a you know light to medium refresh, I think. Um, and again, I'm making this up right now. Um, t Ten thousand, twelve thousand dollars, possibly. Okay. Um, right. You know, if, if if we were looking at you know completely changing providers, um, that's a much larger project, and so that may come with some kind of two or three year um, contract, right, to either spread the the cost out or or a, a more expensive, a much more expensive cost out okay. front. Well, thank you for answering a difficult question. It's just when I heard the <laughs> word massive, and yeah. and I agree with the fact that our, our website is okay, but probably could be better. Um, but knowing it might be somewhere 10 north of 10, not north of 90 or 100. So that's when you, the massive word scared me a little bit. The other two questions I have for you, you're breaking down where that 90,000 that you're requesting uh, increase for expenses. The first two totaled about 30,000 of the 90. So could you give me a breakdown on the e-permits and the third party transparency, how, that, how the rest of the 60,000 breaks down? Sure, absolutely. Um, the the permitting software uh, is budgeted at fifty thousand eight hundred, and the financial transparency uh, additions are budgeted at four thousand three hundred fifty. And um, and so then there's there's a couple of of other um, you know very small increases in, in some other line items that, that round out that difference of about five six thousand. And my last question on the. E permitting. Maybe I'm misunderstanding this. Is this meaning when developers and, and folks want to build something, they'll go through an electronic permit process instead of taking the, the paperwork into the town office? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, that, that's one example of many, yes. Okay. And would there be any increase, decrease, or the same in revenues associated with that? Is there's a cost to filing for permits? Would that change at all? Uh, at, at this moment, I think that remains um, undecided, uh, whether there's um, fees that may increase, stay the same, or decrease as a part of that process. Okay, where I'm wondering is that, and not suggesting that we increase permit fees, but if it's truly quicker, faster, better, I wonder if that's something that's been talked about. Uh, that's the reason I brought it up. So thank you for your, for your answers. Appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you, Josh. Um, did you have any, are there any items on the capital, uh, capital list? I do, yes. Uh, would you like me to move those? Sure, yes, please. Um, to Tim O'Leary, uh, what, is there a page that I, I was kind of looking for the capital items? Is it on the same? Uh... Yeah, I can try to bring it up. I distributed that document some weeks ago, but I think I might be able to bring it up on the screen. Excellent. Yep. So those are the two. Uh, we have uh, the first, which is for $16,000. And this is to replace two of our aging high volume multifunction printers. Uh, so these are the, the larger MFPs, um, you know, print, copy, scan, fax. And so in a, a few months from now, in October of, of 2021, both of these devices will be over eight years old. And so by the time that they uh, actually get replaced, should this move forward, you know, those devices will be about eight and a half, nine years old, um, which, is, which is well beyond uh, what we expect in, in terms of a useful life for uh, a, a machine like that. 
Um, this would be to replace the two oldest in town. Um, so it would be the town clerk's office and the IT department. The uh, second is to replace some security cameras at the police and fire stations. This is to replace four uh, existing legacy security cameras at the police and fire departments. Um, so at the completion of that project, all of our priority cameras at Hopkinton Fire and police will have been replaced with new contemporary cameras that are all directly um, integrated with the town's central video system. And so we would still have a handful of legacy cameras that would remain in place and operational, um, but those, those cameras are not deemed priority. So we would leave them online and essentially just, um, you know, let them, let them die a natural death with no, with no plan to, to replace. Um, so the, the $34,931 represents the replacement of those four cameras. Uh, two of those um, include some underground conduit. And so this, this proposed price um, represents more of a worst case scenario um, because there's some unknowns related to that conduit. And so in a, in a better or best case scenario, the dollar value here may, may decrease by um, $10,000 or so. All right, thank you, Josh. Questions, Wayne, I realized I forgot you. Did you have any? Yeah, a, a, a couple of questions. Um, my connection's fine now, so I guess we can all hear each other. But first, so you say you're at two and a half staff now adding one and a half. That two and a half just seems light for the amount of, for, for what you do. Um, how much do we rely on third party or contract services and will that be, will that spend be impacted at all by the addition of, of new, uh, of new captive staff? Great question. Thank you for, uh, acknowledging that. Um, we rely very little, um, if at all on, um, actually paid consulting or, or third party. Um, I mean, on, on most of our priority one systems uh, that are, you know, software related, we have a support contract in place with the, with the vendor from a licensing or support standpoint, but in terms of um, third party um, support or, or, or paid outsourced help, we, we um, spend no money on that right now. The, the two and a half of us um, figure it out. Um, I mean, I will add that we, we do collaborate with the schools. Um, so, you know, there is, there is a resource at the schools that we will collaborate with. Um, you know, we, we do continue to share some infrastructure, so that, that certainly helps. Um, so really, no, there, there's, there's not a light item for that existing, and so um, it, it doesn't go away because it doesn't exist. Okay, and I wasn't saying it should, I was just trying to get a better picture, <laughs> but no, that's, that's no, impressive. I, I, great, no, I, I appreciate the question, thank you. And just the second question, the printers, are those, is that the, le are those leased? Um, the, also a great question. So it, for some of those machines, historically, we, we did lease those. Um, we've, we've tried to move away from that um, yeah. because we're, we're finding that we, um, you know, we're able to get a, a longer life out of them than having to turn them around in, in three years um, for the lease. Part of that's a challenge in that we're, um, we're, we're tied to that three-year lease cycle. Um, and, and so that can be a, a little bit more expensive than I think it needs to be if, if we just buy it outright and then uh, let it ride for five, six, seven years. But somebody's really done the analysis. Okay, then, thank you. Certainly. All right, thank you. Did anyone have any, other, anyone else have questions on the capital items? No, I'm good. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for Thanks, having Josh. me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Yeah. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, land use. So we have Elaine. That would be me. There. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Sorry if I lose my connection halfway through. Seems a little unstable. Um, so just um, for those who aren't familiar with the land use department, um, it encompasses uh, building, uh, planning, conservation, community preservation, 
um, some of our historical groups and um, in total about support for about 13 boards and committees. Um, so it's a, it's a busy group. Uh, there are eight full-time employees and one part-time employee. And for next fiscal year, proposing level service, so no new positions will be added. Um, we do propose an increase in expenses. Uh, the planning board has requested um, funding for a trails and pedestrian connectivity plan. And that's what the additional $25,000 would be funding. Other than that, it's a, it's a level service budget for the department. And I just wanted to mention that uh, one of our full-time and um, one of our part-time positions are funded, um, their salaries are solely funded through building permit fees. So they're not uh, included in the appropriation for the department. Great. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I'm just trying to bring up the land use trails. Okay. I'm just trying to bring up the line items. All right, does anyone have any questions? Uh, start with uh, uh, Bill. Mute, Bill. Do you have the line items up on your screen? Can you there see them? There we Mark? are, okay. Um, I see it. I, I just checking, I'm looking at the, the budget now and, and you mentioned the word level funding, but I, I see a 5.4% increase on personnel services. Is there, a re, is there a different budget or has it been amended since this one? No, I think I, I if I said level funded, I should have said level service. So it's level service budget. Oh, maybe I misunderstood. My, my That's probably my fault. So um, thank you for that. And okay. just and to, you, go ahead. That's okay. And could you explain a little bit more about the, the additional 25,000 that you talked about? A little bit more detail on that for on the expense side? Yeah, I think so. The planning board would like to. Um, um, undertake a planning effort. Uh, they realize that a lot of people, uh, even before the pandemic, but certainly post pandemic, are using a lot of our trail systems. And one of the things we're mindful of is that some of them don't connect to each other. Um, and people would like them to connect and to connect to neighborhoods and so forth. And so the goal of this plan would be to um, study where the trails are and how we can connect them and come up with a plan for, for making that happen so that. Um, residents can go out and enjoy our system uh, in, a, in a more holistic manner. And connecting to sidewalks, downtown, other points of interest, that's what, what they're looking for. My last couple of questions, has that ever been done before, been looked at like that? Um, no, we've got at pieces of it before. Uh, for example, we, uh, we've had an open space and recreation plan where we talked about um, connecting trails and we've done uh, sidewalk surveys to find out where people wanted sidewalks to connect and to be built. So we've got a, pieces of it before, but we've never looked at the whole town from this standpoint. Okay. I'm just trying to think outside the box for a little bit. I wonder if this might be a project to also include Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, you know, organizations like that, that probably could use that as a way to, to earn some of the qualifications they need. Not that we would substitute one for the other, but maybe have them work uh, along that project in, in, as a way to give back to the town and yet the town giving them some opportunity as well. That's a, a great idea. And, and uh, there's probably other organizations who could participate as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. All right, uh, Shahadul, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, just couple. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for the clarification. One thing I was wondering, how does it relate to the work that the uh, various trail uh, related study and committee that are working on? Um, are they not covering this or this is something outside of their scope? So um, if you're referring to the Upper, Upper Charles Trail Committee, for example, they have a separate budget, but certainly the Upper Charles Trail will be part of this study. So it would be, we would, we kind of know where their route will be and connecting to that would be a, a major feature of a, of a town-wide plan. Um, the Trail Coordination and Management Committee also has a separate budget request um, before you. So what they're doing is more um, 
maintenance, um, planning new trails. So they would certainly be part of an overall effort as well. So different groups have different pieces of, of the trail picture. Got it, thank you. Certainly our trails are uh, you know, much sought after and we are happy to have them and good that uh, we have more activities around it. I just uh, wanna make sure and sounds like you have done. Is there been like a larger discussion across these various trail uh, related activities, uh, uh, just making sure that they are not in siloed form, but in a consistent, coherent, you know, um, longer term plan form, uh, or is that something you are going to pursue with this effort? Yeah, I think that having this plan will help to coordinate all of these separate groups. Um, if each group is out there planning their own trails without an overall plan, I think that's one of the major things that the planning board is trying to get to. Here's our guidance document, let's go and implement it. Yeah, I think that's very much needed. Thank you, good. Thank you, Shadul. Wayne, do you have any questions? Uh, no, Shadul, you covered mine. It was on the coordinate, and Elaine with the coordination of the various, various folks involved in trails, thank you. Right. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, Lane, my only question is that you probably don't have an answer for it. When are we going to connect to the Milford line? I've been on this committee for 10 years and, and a house just went up for sale, like really close. I'm like, that would have connected everything and it's already off the market. Are we? They are. They you, are you, really, you... They're really working on that. <laughs> they're putting a lot of effort into it. Um, I, it will probably be through the woods. <laughs> All right. Yeah, because I I, I do take the trail that starts on uh, off of Granite there, and then it just kind of ends, and I'm like, oh, we're so close to Milford and the Milford Trail, and we can't connect. Yeah. But all right, I didn't expect an answer, but it's always on my mind. Thank you. Um, and you have no capital items. I That's correct. Don't think. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Um, so next uh, we have uh, town clerk and elections. So. Uh, we have, uh, today we have Connor Deegan. Thank you for joining us. Thanks as always for having me. Uh, so as you can, I'll start with the, uh, the town clerk side of it. Um, so uh, currently the only real increase that we're seeing is just for uh, personnel raises. Um, and then there's a slight bump for uh, for stipends due to um, a change in our uh, our population, our voting, a number of voters that I'll actually force us to look at potentially changing one of the stipends that the town approved a few decades, like a decade ago. And another one, which is for, um, for my Massachusetts uh, town clerk certification, which I just passed the test for, so I should get, I'm going to have the application for that soon. So that'll be uh, part of that as well. Uh, and then that's really it for the, uh, for the town clerk budget. As you can see the expenses, there's really no major change because it's really just kind of the basics that we've seen. That, oh, we need to get a few more pens this year and stuff like that. It's, it's minor stuff, office supplies for the most part. Uh, a lot of the kind of things that we would be looking at spending and potentially might be able to look at saving and returning to the town this year are things that we're benefiting from by working with Josh and IT on things like the permitting software that he was discussing during his presentation. Um, and we're being able to use that to shift towards an online solution for dog licensing. Um, and then hopefully as we look towards it more, we'll be able to do it for more and more of our permits that people apply for on an annual basis, or at least, uh, you know, every few years, uh, any questions on the town clerk side or do you want me to just do both and then we can, yeah, why, why, why don't you just do both? Sounds good. Uh, so elections registration, uh, you hear me say this pretty much every single year, cause every single year it does this. It's a roller coaster where it's going to go up and down depending on what's going on that year. So uh, for elections, fortunately, this coming year when we were prepping this budget, we were able to look and say there's no state elections, there's no presidential primary, there's no state primary. Um, we're going to be worrying 
that like we're going to be worrying about some of that going forward but uh this is going to be a significant drop just because of the fact that we don't have quite the same scale um i mean hopefully we're not going to see too massive an impact from some of the changes that we're seeing proposed on the state level there i mean that if if there is hopefully we've been able to uh work with work at getting a few grants this in this fiscal year as well as um we were able to uh, secure some funding from the state auditor. So I'm hoping as we continue to look at some of the unfunded mandates that are coming down from the state, especially regarding elections, that we'll be able to look at some of that alternative funding source to help kind of insulate the town from those, uh, those hikes, or at least make it a bit slower so it's not quite a ripping off a Band-Aid. Um, so that's one of those things too that, like I've said before, that we're going to see that next year that's going to jump right back up. So uh, we'll probably see it kind of go up and down a little bit, and then it's not going to really jump up again until we hit 2024 and have a whole bunch of elections all in a year. But uh, otherwise, this is pretty much what we're just going to see with a dip and up and down. All right. Thank you, Connor. Uh, questions, uh, Bill, do you have any questions? Uh, Connor, could, could you help me understand, because there are not any elections coming up in this fiscal year, what kind of services and expenses do you typically occur in a year where there are no elections? So funny enough, there are elections. There are no major elections, like, uh, like I was saying, with the state elections where we're electing state officers. Okay. However, you every year have at least an annual town meeting and an annual town election, which both are funded through the elections and registration budget. So that personnel cost you're seeing is budgeting for a town meeting and a town election for staffing, uh, which you can see it's significantly different because we're not looking at things like early voting or something like that currently. Uh, and then when it comes to some of the other expenses, it's not just things like, you know, buying ballots for every single election. It's also going to be making sure that our, all of our machines get tune-ups and make sure that they're staying up to date so that we don't run into any issues where people are questioning whether or not those are working properly and we don't run into a jam at the election. Uh, so that's what a lot of that is. And it also includes just some of the stuff that goes around with regular registration. So when I, whenever I have to register a voter, the law also requires that I send them a letter. Uh, so that also comes from from that and any other of that office equipment and office supplies that goes towards uh, ensuring that people get everything they need for voter registration for town census, uh, which is hooked in with voter registration. It's very helpful. Thank you. Good help. All right. Thank you, Bill. Wayne, do you have any questions? Sure, Connor. A quick question, and just and I apologize. I should know, should know more about your function, but. Um, what are the main cost drivers in a major election year as opposed to not? I mean, you mentioned paying for ballots. I, mean, I just never thought that sort of we pay for ballots, but I guess someone has to. Um, don't, you don't have to drain the whole question, but just a couple of the big ones. Yeah, of course. So the biggest driver is definitely personnel. Um, most of our election workers, they work for minimum wage with a handful having more responsibilities that work for slightly more. Uh, so as we see things like increases in minimum wage every year, we see a change in cost equity as well. So the salaries for our wardens goes up to make sure that they still maintain pay equity with our, uh, our checkers who make minimum wage. Okay. Um, so we see that is usually the largest cost driver with, yes, other things like programming for uh, equipment, making sure to keep up with service contracts, and, uh, and then really that's the, those are the big drivers in major years uh, because most of the other stuff is hardware that we already have available. Okay, thank you. Very welcome. Thanks Wayne, uh, Shahadul, any yeah. questions? A uh, couple for Connor, thank you Connor. I think you covered most of the answers. Uh, just some point of clarification. One is uh, the 900 something that, sorry, 9,000 something that you are projecting this year. Uh, and this is probably, you know, the lowest, one of the lowest years, as you mentioned. Now, does that assume 
COVID situation and some of the additional um, mailing and other work that you need to do uh, to manage the COVID, uh, COVID uh, situation uh, voting or it does not? So it does cover some of it. Um, so we, with a lot of the changes that we're seeing with some of the unfunded stuff that's coming from the state where they're changing the game kind of halfway through, um, we're seeing it harder to adapt to this. This was written before uh, Secretary Galvin put forward a bill to uh, expand universal mail-in voting uh, beyond COVID. So uh, we're looking at that as being a potential difference in how much there might be a uh, cost. And so, and Chris uh, knows this as well, that the, uh, the postage budget is put in uh, and consolidated with the treasurer's office and finance. So we try to then see if we can make sure that we can acquire grants and uh, returns on unfunded mandates to try to put that back in to not hurt their budget as much. Because this year was an example of where all of a sudden, obviously, everything went crazy. And we had uh, the secretary sending out the postcards for, to people to request ballots. And that meant that we had uh, over 8,000 ballots to mail out to people, uh, which was quite an operation. Um, but we're going to definitely see some increased changes to that. Now, granted, we've been also really lucky that our health department has made sure that we have everything we need when it comes, and our facilities department, you know, shout out to both Sean, Casey, Dave, Beltorio. They've really made sure we have everything we need when it comes to plexiglass, when it comes to hand sanitizer, uh, when it comes to any kind of cleaning solutions. And then we've also been able to acquire a few things from the state as well as they were preparing and getting COVID funding as well. Thank you for that clarification. And I must say you, um and uh, town administration have done a wonderful job uh, managing the operation during the COVID time. Thank so you. I'm lucky to just have such a great team to work with on it. Uh, I really am. I was listening to everyone else's budgets and I really, um, uh, everything they say, it's amazing what they're able to do with what they have. Indeed, wonderful. And another point of clarification for the uh, personnel, uh, you had asked for 190 and it was then reduced to one, sorry, I don't have the numbers in front of me, 138 or something. So uh, the question is, what was your additional ask for? And now that you don't have it, is there any impact or anything getting pushed out? If you can help clarify that. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the question. Um, so if you recall, it, it's been a while. Last year when we did these meetings, um, one of the things that we discussed uh, was the fact that we are low on, on personnel. Uh, we were able to really scrape it together for this year, but it was really tight for this election year. And we were, uh, you know, trying to see if any of our senior tax credit workers were comfortable working in isolated rooms in the town hall and, uh, and really bringing in a lot of election officers for, other daily tasks. Um, so there was a lot of additional uh, personnel need. So we had looked at trying to see that for as we're coming up to more elections in coming years, to be able to work on onboarding somebody who would be able to uh, work part-time. But when we were looking at it uh, and discussing it with town manager and, uh, and Tim, we were looking and seeing that it was gonna be a pretty sturdy hit. So we wanted to try to see if we could limit the impact by trying to find um, an alternative solution. So we were kind of looking at a few other uh, potential solutions with the town manager's office to see if we can address that for now. But it was something that we put in and we're gonna keep looking for in the future because it's something that especially was uh, much more relevant as we hit COVID because um, there were a lot of folks who did not feel comfortable going into the office, understandably so. Uh, and they were people who, you know, we relied on heavily for some tasks that were maybe minor tasks, but they were uh, overall very time consuming. Um, 
even things like dog licenses, like actually stuffing mail-in ballots and everything else was, uh, it took us probably an additional 60 hours of part-time labor to be able to pull off per week. Makes sense. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. No, thank you very much for the question. I thank you. Any other questions? I think we're good. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you, Connor. Thanks, Connor. Yeah. All right. I think that covers everyone for today. Uh, so I see you want to do finance. Yep. Let okay. Me, let me pick up at the end with finance. <laughs> And I have a quick presentation for you. The finance department really has two roles. We deliver direct services to the public and we also provide support services to other parts of the town government, including the appropriation committee. Our vision reflects those roles. The finance team is working on structured continuous improvement in our processes to drive quality service outcomes internally for finance and across the town enterprise. So everything we do is part of a process. The budget is a process, paying bills is a process, collecting taxes is a process. Every, everything we do is part of a process. So we're process driven. Our processes include the tax system, billings and collections, management of cash and investments, uh, information about near-term and long-term finances that we put out. That's for our internal customers. For the rest of the town government, we support thousands of annual utility billings. We do temporary and long-term borrowings to support capital projects. We run a timely, accurate payroll system. We help manage the budget process and we do financial analysis to support spending and investment decisions. Let me share the screen here. So for these functions, the treasurer, collector, assessor, payroll, and CFO, we are requesting a total of $936,000, which is up from $890,000 in FY21, just under 1% of the general fund operating budget goes to perform these functions. Uh, you can see that from, from 21 to 22, I had some more notes over here behind where the behind where the faces are. But from 21 to 22, salary and expense line is up 1.8%. And overall, we would be up 1.8%, except we have one extra line that we're requesting a $30,000 increase in appraisal services. The entire additional amount is to support our engagement on, with Eversource on the LNG plant. Eversource appealed assessments for the LNG plant for 2014, 2015, and 2016, and we defended that at the Appellate Tax Board last year, and we prevailed. And now we're waiting to hear, uh, that was at the, tax, at the tax board. Now we're waiting to hear if they will appeal that to the Appellate Court, uh, and we are putting aside money for that possibility. Uh, we don't know if they're going to go to the Court of Appeals. So $10,000 are for additional legal expenses. For appeals, we expect them to, to file for 2017 through 2020. Yeah, even though we resolved the earlier years, we expect them to go forward with their appeals. The tax board had stalled those appeals until they uh, finished with the first batch. The other 20000 of the 30000 is also tied to Eversource. The LNG facility is going through a substantial renewal. So we need a rebaseline property taxes for that facility. And it will be on the order of in the hundred or hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, because of Eversource's long record of appealing, we are gonna take the unusual step of spending an extra $20,000 for a court ready appraisal. Normally we would do a light appraisal, issue the tax bill, most taxpayers pay, and then we never have to go to court. We're, we have a fairly high confidence that Eversource is likely to appeal. So instead of doing the appraisal twice at a much higher cost, we're just gonna do the gold plated uh, appraisal at the outset for an extra $20,000. So we will be ready for Eversource's appeal. 
The town's tax relationship with Eversource is very challenging and it's very expensive and it's not unique to Hopkinton. Eversource uh, appeals their tax billings against all the small towns they operate in all over the state. And uh, they make it very challenging for towns to go up against them. It's hard to find experts who can, who can go toe to toe with them. You have to have a willingness to go out and, and uh, fight with them. Most towns don't have an amount of property at stake as we do from that LNG facility. So I would say of everybody in the Commonwealth who's being pushed around by Eversource, we are probably the ones most affected by it. And we are continuing to, uh, continuing to stand firm. Any questions? I have a I have a question. I know this has been ongoing. Are we in our fifth or sixth or seventh year on this Eversource thing? What oh, do well, we do? Oh, sorry. Was that the question? No. <laughs> How many years are we in? Okay. No. Uh, so, can you? I know because we have some new members. Well, Bill, what mm -hmm. what is at stake if we get this? It's not like it's considered new. It's not new growth where we get this. It just redistributes who pays what percentage in the, in the town, correct? Okay, so I'm gonna take a stab at this. I actually have notes for this question because it's a great question that's been asked before, but then we have John Neese with us too to, to layer in on whatever I miss. So the accurate assessment on the LNG facility doesn't create new revenue. What it does is protect all the homeowners and all the business owners who make up the rest of the tax base so that we are not all paying a share of Eversource's bill. So for example, if the town were to underassess Eversource by $100 million, which could happen in this recapitalization, homeowners and small businesses would be picking up $1.7 million of that Eversource tax bill. So for an average homeowner with a $655,000 house would be covering $250 of that bill for Eversource. Um, so that's basically what would be on the line. We're, we're protecting every average homeowner from, a, from carrying $250 for every $100 million we underassess the Eversource bill. And I have more notes, but I, does that get to what you're asking? Yes, it was, that was, I kind of knew the answer, but I thought everyone, just a refresher of why this is important that we're- John, John Neese sure. has been sitting here patiently and he is the hero of this story, in my mind anyways. So why don't I give him a chance to chime in. John, anything you want to add on for this? No, it's a very complicated issue and I could probably go on for hours. I mean, I am very happy to answer, um, you know, any questions or give you a further overview, but, um, you know, Tim offered a good explanation for that particular question you had. So, so John is the president of the Massachusetts Assessing Association, and he is the, the lead instructor in assessing training across the Commonwealth. So if any town needs him, it's us. And we're really, we're really lucky to have him and glad to have him. All right, thank you, John. Thank you, Tim. All right, does anyone have any questions uh, on the finance yep. budget? Uh, I've got uh, two. Uh, okay. Sure, go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Thank you. Um, we've been successful. You've been successful in winning these appeals. Is there any ever any recovery of the costs to appeal? That's that doesn't happen. Okay. No, no. They have a right to appeal. Go ahead, John. Um, I I have a little different opinion than Tim, but okay. but his, his answer is probably correct. So we, we actually have um, eight years at issue going back all the way to two thousand and fourteen. So 14, 15, and 16 were decided in the town's favor, but as he mentioned, we are waiting for the findings of fact from the appellate tax board um, to see if LNG will go to the appeals court and then to the Supreme Judicial Court. Um, if they don't move forward, you know, we would ask them to withdraw um, years 17 through 21. Um, I don't expect that will happen because they seem to, to like to litigate um, these cases and, and uh, cost the town more money. But it, it is an issue of fair cash value and, and equity for all taxpayers in town. Uh, if we appeal, if, if they don't appeal, um, we are gonna go to town council and we, gonna, we are gonna ask town council 
to ask the appellate tax board if we can recover any of the town council fees or uh, the expert fees. Usually the appellate tax board will not grant that, but we are very proactive and we are aggressive and we will certainly make that request. Thank you. So if the, if the tax board begins to believe that Eversource is behaving in bad faith, maybe they would break precedent and give us some fees and that would certainly dampen down this behavior a little bit maybe going forward. I won't my say other sir, question, right. thanks, my other question, and maybe you used it just as an example, but you said something along the lines of an, an another assessment is coming up and it, it could go down. Is there any, okay, you just use that, if it went down a hundred million, it would cost. No, no, what I'm saying is if, if we don't do a robust assessment and we fail to capture a hundred million dollars in value that we could capture, okay, the, the other taxpayers would be out 1.7 million. So it's really worth it for us to pay close attention to the valuation of this facility. You'll hear the growth people talk a lot about growth. Uh, I don't know if I have the... I don't know if I have the stats right with me, but but getting a fair assessment on that property is worth about a 50% jump in our industrial tax base. You know, we, we, do, we would have to get a 50% jump in our industrial tax base to offset the blunder of not getting a full assessment from them on the LNG plant. Thank you. Could I, um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but to give you a little uh, more perspective, um, they own about 18 parcels now in Hopkinton. Um, for all of the fiscal years in question, there are only two parcels, um, you know, that are under dispute, 52 and 55, uh, 52 and 55 Wilson Street. And the town value on those two parcels is somewhere around the $55 million number. Uh, LNG claims that they are worth $28 million. And again, the appellate tax board in the three years that have been heard found at the town's assessed value. However, the reason that we would like to spend the money and go forward with a new valuation from our expert is that his value for 14, 15, and 16 was that essentially $55 million number when the initial what's called a summary appraisal report was done. When he was preparing to go to trial, he did what's called a court-ready appraisal for those years, and his value uh, in testimony came in at somewhere between 70 and 80 million. Now, the appellate tax board can't go higher in their decision than what they are assessed for, but that prompted the discussion between Tim and I to say, well, if now he's saying it was 70 to 80 million in 2014, maybe it's worth 100 million today, and maybe it's worth spending the money. We cannot, as an assessor, and as a town on a special purpose property like this, change the assessment from one year to another without an expert's report. Um, that's a requirement from uh, the Division of Local Services or the umbrella that we function under. So that's the reason for the new appraisal. Thank you, it's very helpful. In, in the size of this recapitalization, I mean, they're, they're gonna go, they're going through and renewing this entire facility and spending a very large amount of money in there. We need to capture that value in the tax base. And I think, oh. uh, I, through the chair, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one, um, Tim, I think, thank you. This is a good discussion and uh, for building up the clear picture of the things of a very complex uh, issue. And thank you, John, for uh, providing your expertise, uh, we are lucky to have you. I was going to ask that um, if we go with the court issued um, appraisal, how bulletproof is that? What the real benefit is, is that we don't have to go back and do a second court ready appraisal later. So bulletproof, you know, I mean, it's up to the, the tax board to decide if they think the, the gas company can make a legitimate appeal to our claim. But what we're trying to avoid here is spending, and I, I don't know, John can correct me on the numbers, spending 70 now and 70 later to do the first report or, or 50 now and 90 later. We're just spending the full amount now to get the court ready appraisal because we think while the initial appraisal would be sufficient for the requirement John discussed, to issue the uh, 
to issue the appraisal, it wouldn't be sufficient to defend the appraisal in court. That's really what it comes down to. Is that about right, John? It, it is, and uh, we're not quite sure of the numbers going forward if we didn't do it this way, but basically the expert gave us two choices. He said that he would do another summary appraisal report for $40,000, or he would do a court-ready appraisal report for $70,000, but he did make it clear that if we selected the 40, it would cost more than 30 um, additional more than thirty thousand additional dollars to then prepare a court ready appraisal. So we're not sure exactly what that cost would be, but ultimately it would be more than the seventy thousand dollars. Thank you. That that helps, and certainly it's a, it's a smart move to uh, calculate that and do that. And to understand a little more uh, on the ROI aspect of it, and you've already answered it. I, I just wanted to uh, understand some of the nuances and the details if you have it, uh, which is if we go in the last three years, so you have, we have done an assessment for an amount and Eversource uh, uh, contested that, then we had to go through legal process and reassess potentially. Can you give us that cost scenario? I'm trying to uh, assess how you know, troublesome it is and how much ROI we are talking about. So let me try to answer that in two parts. First, I think John just said that it was going to be 40 to do the initial low appraisal and substantially more than 30 to do the rework. So it would have been well over 70 to get to the court ready appraisal if we did it in two steps. It's 70 if we do it in one step. So because we thought the probability of having to go to court was greater than 50%, we thought it was prudent to go ahead and get the, the court ready appraisal done right now. In terms of the ROI, for an average homeowner, if you have that $655,000 house and we spend $150,000 fighting Eversource on your behalf, your share of that is 22 bucks, okay? So, and I had said a few minutes ago that if, if it was a hundred million dollar change and you know, John's talking 50, 90, but they're putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the renewal of this facility. So a hundred million dollar increment got that homeowner uh, 250 bucks back a year, every year. So that's a $250 annuity you're basically getting for 20 bu 22 buck expense and legal fight if, if those are the rough numbers. Now maybe it's 50 million and not a hundred million so maybe that'd be 125 bucks a year going forward for a $22 upfront investment. We basically think that we're in the zone where the amount of play in these estimates in the tax base is so substantial that to commit $20 for the average homeowner in legal fight is, is something we just have to do. One other financial perspective, uh, if I could, and if it might help you, but um, we are required to carry forward the value from one year to another without a new appraisal. Um, in a certification year, which used to be on a three-year cycle and has now changed to a five-year cycle, we are required to have a new appraisal. Our last certification year in Hopkinton was 2019. The Division of Local Services wanted us to spend the money and have a new appraisal done. I convinced them to um, let the town not spend the money because we had so many cases pending at the appellate tax board and we had some that had been scheduled for hearing. They made it very clear that for 2024, which is our next certification year, that we would have to have a new appraisal done. But again, from now until 2024, without an appraisal, we would have to carry forward that $55 million value each and every year. So what Tim and I had discussed was spending the money for 22 rather than waiting until 24 um, to see if you know, the value is really 100 million or more. Thanks. Thanks, Shahadul. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, let's see, Wayne, you have any questions? Sure. Um, so I mean, 
Now looking at the, 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 the shift between the homeowners and Eversource, what is the net impact to Eversource per, like for, for the period that's, uh, that's in question? Roughly. I guess we are in dispute to the amount of about 30 million a year for three years for the case we litigated. Is that about right, John? Uh, 28 to 55, 38, 48, 58. Yeah, 20, 25 million or so, maybe 27 million, something like that. So that's maybe, in value. Maybe under 90 million. So maybe that's worth about 1.4, 1.5 million to us in okay. play from those years. And as John said, if we prevail in those years and they give up, we've got several more years in the queue, you know, with that same kind of money in play. Okay. There's four more years in the queue. Okay. And, and just out of curiosity, how, how are they, how are we valuing that property? It just strikes me. And I remember sitting on the presentation from the original when we had that firm come in in probably 13 and they came up with a one, you know, a value based on the, the economic value of the property, the revenue, one based upon the steel and rivets that went into it on and on and on. What did we go with? Like, how did we I assume it's got to be something related to the, to the economic value of that property? John, take it away. All right. So, um, you know, the expert considered all three standard appraisal approaches to value. So cost, income, and sales. Um, and um, if I remember correctly, um, you know, he certainly introduced evidence for all of them. Um, and I think that his basic premise was income as opposed to the other two. Okay. Thank yeah, you. So we actually brought in an economist uh, last summer, a PhD economist uh, runs a, a consulting program out of Tufts, I believe. And we really wanted to play the idea that, you know, it's, it's, it's like a subsidiary with that only sells to itself. So it's like the kind of thing Steve Jobs used to do when he would sell himself stuff at break even in the US and then make all his money offshore, right? So we were like, we can't go by what you report as sales. We have to go by the economic contribution this peak loading facility makes to their enterprise. And it's enormously important to their enterprise. If they didn't have that facility, they would have to build more infrastructure to meet peak winter demand at massive, massive cost. So there's a massive cost avoidance for them and a logical efficiency by having this peak loading facility where they can basically have this giant gas battery here in our town and use it during the peak demand periods. Otherwise, they'd have to, we'd have to be building more pipelines or you know, radically and expensively building out the infrastructure. And so the appraiser integrated some of that thinking into their arguments. And I think that's gonna be important in our argument going forward. It's like, uh, you can tell us that you own a train and you know the engine is worthless but without the engine you don't have a train you have a you have a camper right you have a, cars that sit on a track and so our argument is that this thing is an incredibly valuable asset regardless of what their internal transfer pricing practices are okay thank you and my last question which tim i think i've asked you how long have you been here to, this is my third year. Third year. Okay, and I've asked it before that. It's still worth the sp chasing. This is still worth worth what we're spending, and it sounds like it is. Yes. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank yes. you, Jeff. More so. More so as they recapitalize. Yep. So we have Ben Sweeney here to talk about accounting and his former function of grants and procurement. Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. I will be brief. The accounting department's mission is to establish and operate an effective set of internal controls that are consistently adhered to, maintain financial records that are accurate and timely, that support stakeholders, and to maintain compliance with all federal, state, and local regulations. Uh, the department is made up of two people, the town accountant and assistant town accountant. You'll notice in fiscal 2022, the request is a 17% decrease from the fiscal 21 budget. And that's largely around uh, salary differential from the retirement of the former town accountant and assistant town accountant. So there's no change in the staffing level in fiscal 22. We process approximately 65,000 transactions every year, uh, as well as uh, work with our, our primary regulators, the Department of Revenue. 
uh, and through various processes, as well as our external auditors, there's Ellie and Clark to do the annual financial statement audit, which both are completed for fiscal 2020. So in fiscal 2022, our, our, one of our primary priorities is further integrating MUNIS into our processes by deploying either undeployed or underutilized modules in the system. And in fiscal 22, we're also working towards being more current in our in the MUNIS release schedule. We're currently about five releases behind uh, their release schedule. So we're seeking to be more current in that cycle to take advantage of uh, new processes that'll move us more towards the electronic uh, environment and less paper. So I'm happy to answer any questions about that or, or move on to the, the grants procurement department. Why don't, you, why don't you do everything that's on your list? So we Great. Can... Oops, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the procurement grants position is requesting a level funded service budget uh, from fiscal 21 to fiscal 22. The position is currently open. But the select board has approved hiring this position, and we anticipate that, that we'll have that position filled by the end of fiscal 21. So since this position was started in November 18, uh, we generated uh, approximately $4 million in new grant revenue. Um, so just to run a couple of the large ones, it's 400, 548,000 for the safer grant program to pay for four new firefighters, $3 million from a MassWorks grant to support the Main Street Corridor Project, $350,000 for new portable radios for the town of Hopkinton and Ashland Fire Departments, $200,000 from um, the Department of Con Conservation and Management to improve energy efficiency at school buildings. So th those numbers, I think, clearly demonstrate that this position has a, has a real opportunity to give a very good ROI for the community in terms of grant money to have someone focused on going out there and, and actively applying for these grants and also allows department heads to continue to have their primary focus on achieving their mission. So again, th th thank you for that opportunity. Um, it's a level service request for procurement and grants and again, a 17% decrease in the accounting side, and we anticipate no changes in service. And, and again, there's no change in headcount uh, in terms of approved positions. We still three positions for both departments combined. Okay, does that cover everything? That, that's it, Mr. Chair, thank you. All right, questions. Uh, Wayne, do you have any questions? No, good news. I like seeing some negative numbers next to the <laughs> budget, but uh, no, thank you. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Shahadul, do you have any questions? Shahadul? All right, Bill. Bill, do you have any questions? The only question, Ben, is there's you and an, and an assistant accountant, um, how does, does that feel good? Is it comparable to other towns of our size to have a staff of two to do all that you do? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Chair, I would say that it is. Uh, we, in terms of, you know, one of the big things that we do is, is process all the town bills for various departments. We have a decentralized uh, account entry process. So the, the administrative assistants at the departments are ones entering all the bills into Munis. So we're, we're managing that process and, um, also, this, the school has a has a finance department to manage their their bill paying process. So, uh, it's pretty typical to have a, a town accountant and assistant town accountant in this in this type of department. Thank you. Then I, I guess about sixty eight percent of our money goes out in payroll or a couple large checks for benefits and debt payments. So a lot of our a lot of our volume goes out through those vehicles. And then there's the bill paying side, right, Ben? Correct. That, that, that represents a, a larger chunk transaction-wise, uh, which we, we need to assure are, are compliant with the law. Great, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Let's see, uh, Shahadul. <laughs> we, we lost, <laughs> we lost, we lost. <laughs> Wait, is that Shahadul laughing? I couldn't tell who that is. But. He's no, laughing, I but I don't know if it's audio again. I don't know if he's happy, but <laughs> tears of happiness or joy or uh, sadness there. No, we can't. We can't hear you. So, uh, all right. So, uh, let's see. Bill, got any more? Bill Wayne, good. No, good. Thank you. All right. 
Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. I think that's that's all for the uh, all our discussions for this week. Um, I think on the next uh, part of the agenda is review questions from previous budget sessions. Um, so I got the the download from Ben that you're interested in an expanded report in the Appropriations Committee report uh, on pandemic expenses and a detailed description of the one-time money being used, which of course we had in last year's and has been mentioned in all the budget mentioned, all the budget messages and will be prominently uh, mentioned if in fact we use one-time money for recurring costs in this budget. So I, that's what I have on my work list as the outstanding items. Uh, we've got a good start on the text of the draft appropriation committee report. Uh, of course, we have a revision to go here It'll be based on what we learn about the $1.9 trillion and how we can use our little share of it. Uh, we think at the very least, we are highly, let me say hopeful. I don't want to say I'm highly confident. We're extremely hopeful and somewhat confident that at least we'll be able to cover the 200,000 we have budgeted for personal protective equipment. And we hope that the flexibility that has been advertised will be flexibility to spend the extra federal money on things we need to spend it on in 22. So we think we're gonna get money. We think it's gonna be more money than we had before. We are pretty sure it'll be available over two years. So we don't wanna spend it all the first day. We wanna probably pace it out over two years. We're pretty sure it'll cover at least $200,000 of the costs we have in the budget, which will allow us to take less from reserves. And we're hopeful that the rules will allow us to spend yet more of that money to displace things that we're currently would be funding through, through stabilization funds in the budget. But we won't know that for sure until we see the rules. They're telling us they're gonna be more flexible. What we don't know is if they're gonna be flexible in the ways we need them to be and in the ways that will give us the relief we need, right? They might give Fall River what they need they might give Chelsea what, it, what Chelsea needs. We're not sure yet that they're gonna give us what we need. So uh, we expect one more round of budget adjustments and we will not be doing that. We don't wanna do three steps with partial information. We'll do it when we get the rules from the, from the state and the federal government and we know what we're gonna be able to do with this money. I anticipate that the select board is gonna send you the budget as revised on February 2nd with the governor's increase in local aid when they meet next Tuesday, and that will be the product you receive, but you will sometime in our deliberation in the coming weeks, you will receive a final revision, but the select board will not have that for Tuesday night. And you will not have it the day you get that referral. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Okay. So did we cover both items three and four? Because this is estimated. We did. I think we did. And so I, I think have... I might have covered five. I mean, uh, the, the, the report is coming together. As you know, it's a lot of text and then it's uh, tables and graphs. And of course the tables and graphs can't be produced until we come to the final resolution and I would say that the, the language is at about 90%. So with, with blanks, strategic blanks and spots that say what the percentage of this will be and what the percentage of that will be. And of course, the section on the use of stabilizations is highly uncertain because it's gonna change. But uh, I would say all the other things that people are used to seeing in the report is at about 80% product. And fortunately uh, last year, Really, Ben did the, did the uh, yeoman's work of integrating all these former uh, data feeds we had into a single set of spreadsheets. And we're able to produce, once we do an update, we're now able to produce a new iteration in about an hour, a print ready iteration of the budget in about an hour. In my first year here, it was hours of running around asking people if they caught this change and that change. 
because every change you make changes the budget in 11 different places. So we've now got an integrated tool that was, uh, the price was great because Ben built it in the spare time on a, on a, a Google Sheets. And uh, it's, it's easy to understand and easy to use. Uh, we could probably spend a couple hundred thousand dollars and get something more elegant, but this is cheap and effective, which is really our, our favorite kind of product. So uh, it's, uh, so we're, we're, we feel like we're in great shape here. And we have the production ability to do this very timely, this report very timely as we get this final information about uh, what, this, what this federal money will be available for and the town manager can adjust his recommendation. Thank you, Tim. You just brought up a question I have. So are we still slated to have annual town meeting on the scheduled date is because of COVID and is there a facility that we're gonna have it or is it gonna be a Zoom town meeting? I'm, I'm sure it's not, but what? So there's, I, I, I think you're gonna hear from the select board on this Tuesday night and I don't wanna uh, usurp their, their thunder. And uh, so you, you'll, you'll have, we'll have the answer to that Tuesday or by next Thursday. Okay. Does anyone else have any uh, questions? Okay, well, thanks for a good meeting and uh, thanks for all your work on this. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Uh, do we hear a motion to adjourn? I move that we adjourn. All right, we have to do a roll call to adjourn. Uh, Bill? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Shahadul? Or yes. thumbs up? Oh, we can hear you. <laughs> yes. <Back. laughs> all right, well, yes, for nothing, we are adjourned. So thank you very thank much, you. everybody. Have a good Bye, evening. Everyone. Thank Good you. Night, everyone. Bye.